в основе нашей политики – свобода. Свобода выбора для всех самостоятельно определять свое будущее и будущее своих детей. Over the last seven months, Ukraine has been brutalized by Russia. Civilians targeted, infrastructure destroyed, a quarter of the population forced to flee. In Russia, though, you're not supposed to call this brutal war a war. It is a special military operation to protect the people of the Donbass. Ironically, YouTube has its own censorship issues, which is putting it mildly. So I'm going to bleep the word war and a bunch of other words too, because that'll probably help not get this video suppressed. This video is about the insane, schizophrenic world of Russian propaganda, where you see one thing with your own eyes and you just get told the complete opposite, and why, unfortunately, people still believe these insane lies as a harbinger of Western decay, foreign agent, enemy of traditional values, corrupter of youth, and propagandist of homosexuality, I would ask you to please subscribe. The lies start at the very top. This is the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. This is you know fucking who. Наши действия это самозащита от создаваемых нам угроз, и при этом в наши планы не входит оккупация украинских территорий. If you followed the in Ukraine even a little bit, you will know that everything they're saying is the complete opposite of the truth. There's there's no angle here, there's no spin. What's happening here is that the Kremlin has just completely given up on outward-facing propaganda. They are not trying to make Russia seem respectable to the rest of the world anymore. All they're trying to do now is just keep the Russian people on their side and keep them obedient. And within the country, there's this entire propaganda apparatus that sort of builds a world around these lies and manages to actually make them effective. Lies don't need to be believable if you create conditions in which people will voluntarily choose to believe them. So this propaganda apparatus has three main qualities. It's based on emotion, it's contradictory rather than affirmative, and it's enforced. Мы только начинаем свой путь в мире, о котором знаем очень мало. I watched a lot of Russian TV to make this video, and what I've learned is that most of the propaganda content they produce is not based on facts or even lies pretending to be facts. It's mostly just abstract emotional rants, and there are only three topics. Russia is special and great, but everyone hates us, but we will show them. This guy, Vladimir Solovyov, is one of the top Kremlin propagandists, and he translates these points really well. Соловьев's favorite thing is being threatening. He especially likes talking about nukes. He can take the most random topic and somehow make it about Russian greatness. For example, visas. Вот они виза русских не пускают. Вот русских не пускают. Чё нас пускать не пускают? Мы не спрашивали в сорок четвертом, сорок пятом, и сейчас спрашивать не будем. Понадобится нам в Европу, заедем, зайдем. All these propagandists position themselves as one with the people. И конечно мы будем защищать свой народ. Especially this lady, Margarita Simonyan, notable embezzler and head of Russia Today, the wildly ineffective Western audience-oriented branch of the Kremlin media machine. They say things like, we won't take this. Our people know when they're being lied to. It's always either outside enemies the West, or if it's really impossible to blame the West, if it's clear that Russia is harming Russians, then they're going to point the finger at mid-tier officials. They're going to say those people are incompetent, those people are doing a bad job. For example, here she's talking about the messy mobilization in Russia and people being sent to the front with no combat experience. И мне хочется обратиться к командирам, которые вот так подошли к этому. Если эта ситуация не исправится, мы же публикуем эти фамилии. Пусть любуются собой в СМИ. 
but the supreme commander will make sure to get them to do their job properly. And then they immediately lead the conversation back to their favorite topic of our enemies are out to get us and we must fight them. И нужно задавать себе вопросы. Мы что хотим? Наше общество сейчас довести до истерики? Или мы хотим его консолидировать, чтобы мы единым кулаком всю добили эту вот гадину, да? I would like to point out that if you're trying to convince people that others are and that you yourself are not in fact using words like vermin might not be the best choice. The essence of Russian propaganda is gaslighting but stupid. You just take whatever your critics are saying about you and you say it back to them. А Байден собирается на Генассамблее ООН объявить битву между автократиями и демократиями на целое столетие. Только он почему-то считает, что демократия это они, а мы-то знаем, что демократия это мы. Russian propaganda is like if an ideology could have a full-blown personality disorder. In this case, narcissistic personality disorder. It has the grandiosity and the deep insecurity and the sort of viciousness. This type of content is directed mostly at the poor, less educated Russians, especially those who are a bit older and more likely to trust the TV over the internet. These are the parts of the population where Putin is actually popular, even though his politics make them suffer the most. If you are poor in Russia, nobody has your interest in mind. It's a kleptocracy, it's not big on social justice. Russia respects power and wealth and not much else. You're likely to feel angry and scared and you'll be looking for someone to blame. Putin has always known this and he's always been good at finding enemies for Russian people to blame and be angry at. It used to be, for example, queer people. I mean, it, it still is. Queer people were used by Putin as a proxy for the West as a symbol of everything that's wrong with Western values and as a danger to the traditional values that supposedly are very important to Russians. And now it's the Ukrainian Nazis who, you know, elected a Jewish president, 70% of the people voted for him, you know, as one does when one is a Nazi. And again, here, Putin appeals to Russians past, talking about how Russians fought the actual in World War II, and uses Ukrainians as a proxy for the West, saying that they are NATO's pawn. Let's say people believe him. Still, the problem is, neither Ukrainians nor queer people are attacking Russia. Russia is attacking them. But Putin justifies this by saying that Russians must stand up for their values that are being attacked. So there's no physical attack happening whatsoever, but he insists that these groups are attacking Russians just by existing. People will jump through hoops and do complicated mental gymnastics to force themselves to believe this narrative. Зачем украинцам, если вот так как бы подумать, да, зачем им убивать собственное население? Ну, это геноцид. Просто геноцид. А геноцид кого? Если Украина убивает украинцев, получается собственное население? Собственный народ, да. Вот от этого аж волос дыбом. Ну, this is because, and I'm not trying to justify the fact that people believe this, but I think it's fascinating to understand the underlying emotional basis for this insanity. And I think it's the fact that if you're scared and angry, and the reason you're suffering is your government, then it's just you against Putin, and your chances are zero. But... If the reason you're suffering are these enemies that big, strong Putin is fighting for you, then your chances are much higher. Okay, this part is extra grim. Trigger warning for anything you can possibly think of. When a report about Russian in Ukraine comes out, and there have been a lot of them over the past seven months, the Kremlin immediately denies everything and then spits out as many counter-arguments as it possibly can. Their strategy isn't to prove that they are telling the truth, but to convince as many people as they can that the other side might be lying. One example of how this works is the reporting done on Bucha in April 2022. In late February, shortly after the beginning of the war, Russian armed forces encircled Kyiv. They weren't able to take Kyiv as planned, though. So instead, they occupied small cities around the capital, like Irpin, Bradyanka, and Bucha, and stayed there frustrated and ungoverned for over a month. 
At the end of March, the Russian armed forces gave up on Kiev and redeployed to the east. And on April 3rd, international press was allowed to enter the city. And what came out was some of the most horrific images I've ever seen. I do not want to show it here without the blurring, but it was just dozens of f lying in the street. The Russian Ministry of Defense immediately responded. Not a single local resident has suffered from any violent action. They then presented quote unquote evidence and look, I want to be really clear that by looking at this evidence, I am not entertaining any of it, even for a minute, but I think it's important to look at it closely to understand how Russian propaganda works. Russian units withdrew completely from Bucha as early as March 30th. On March 31st, the mayor of Bucha did not mention any locals shot in the streets. Evidence did not emerge until the fourth day. And then the ministry says basically that the in the photos don't look old enough. They aren't saying this outright, but what they are implying is that between March 31st and April 3rd, Ukrainians came into the city and their own people to make Russia look bad. I don't really know what to say to that. Just you. I hate having to respond to this, but one, three days between the city being freed and press allowed in is normal protocol. Civilians have to stay off the streets until the Ukrainian army is done clearing the city of mines that the Russians leave behind everywhere. Two, most of the photos aren't close-ups. Three, a lot of the bodies that are visible do display decay. Four, the New York Times and others use satellite images to prove that bodies were already lying in the streets as early as March 13th. Five, Bellingcat found videos of these same bodies from different dates and angles. And six, interviews with dozens of Bucha locals corroborate the photographic evidence of civilian and ex Then this story is picked up by TV propagandists who add their own surmises. Here is a video of a street that doesn't have any bodies on it. The reports came out at the same time, which seems suspicious. The Ukrainians chose Bucha because it sounds like the word butcher. It's just, it's just so f***ing sad. It's so sick. The Ministry of Defense also pitched a false actor theory, even though it contradicts their first theory. They claim that in this video, you can see one of the bodies move its arm. I actually thought this was fascinating because at first glance, it does kind of look like there's an arm that's moving. But an open source investigations team slowed the video down and provided a negative of it. And that way you can see that it's a raindrop that's moving on the windshield. So the strategy of the propaganda apparatus when they're facing actual facts is to present as many counter arguments as they possibly can. Just throw anything out there and see what sticks. It doesn't matter if it doesn't coalesce into a single narrative. It doesn't matter if almost all of it is completely unbelievable. Because if you support Putin, you will grab on to any of these lies like a drowning man to a f***ing straw rather than believe that your government did this. Since April, more and more evidence of Russian war crimes in Bucha and elsewhere has surfaced. There was never any doubt that atrocities happened, but now the proof is insurmountable. There has been no objective government media in Russia in decades. Even the straight up newsy news channels are just spouting the same emotional propaganda like our heroes, we're fighting evil. There are free Russian language media outlets online, but they're all based in Europe nowadays because Russia loves and jailing journalists. To combat these sources, Russia is trying very unsuccessfully to cordon off the internet like China did. Large chunks of the internet, like all of Facebook, all of Instagram, are technically inaccessible, but they totally are via VPNs. The problem is there's still Russia's own social media. So Russia has laws policing actual individual free speech, which is some 1984 shit. It is illegal to call Russia's invasion of Ukraine a war. And there are people literally in jail right now for that. And in general, civil dissent in Russia is quite harshly punished. A lot of online discourse about the war in, among Russians and Ukrainians has been about the blame falling on Russians. Like, how did we let it come to this? There have been a lot of think pieces which discuss the complacency of both liberal and non-liberal elites, young professionals who earn a lot of money, entrepreneurs, because the aughts and the 2010s were so affluent that it was easy to just be apathetic. Yes, if you're queer, you have to hide. Yes, if you're a person of color, you're basically treated like shit across the board. But 
when you're sipping an Aperol spritz on a rooftop bar celebrating the launch of your matcha latte delivery service, life isn't so bad. Yeah, human rights are getting eroded, but I mean, you're doing good. This apathy was skillfully conditioned by the regime. The regime is like a noose. And every time we struggled, the noose was tightened a little more. There were massive protests in 2011-2012. Group protests are banned. Then there were individual protests. Now that's not a possibility. Rights were taken away little by little by little. That teaches you that struggle doesn't just get you nowhere. It's counter-effective. I kind of hate Hemingway, but he does have this really good quote. How did you go bankrupt? Two ways, gradually, then suddenly. Russia has become a straight up classic, exemplary fascist government in those two ways. That fascism was brewing. The militaristic, the racist, the nationalist, imperialist culture was brewing slowly, slowly, slowly. And then it just erupted like a f-ing pustule all over the world in this massive explosion of pain. Yeah, I guess the lesson is to my friends in more liberal countries is we got to be careful. We got to be, you know, the gradual worsening is just as much part of the worsening as the abrupt worsening. I'm half Russian which I bring up in every video to add color. (laughs) And I grew up in, in Moscow. I cannot begin to explain the shame I feel about what my country is doing in Ukraine. I I truly think it's and I think it's going to be a blight on, on Russians for generations to come. We're going to carry this because I'm so ashamed. I really like compulsively want to talk about what I'm doing and about what every Russian I know is doing to help Ukrainians. But as I'm well aware, now is not the time for Russians to be asking for forgiveness. I still mentioned it because I'm a baby. Now is just the time to act and do everything we can to help. I'm listing my favorite volunteers and organizations in the video description below. Tiny orgs that are super brave, that are working on the ground because UNICEF. The average Ukrainian salary is $300 a month. So even a really small donation goes a very long way. Please check out the list and donate if you feel you want to do that. And thank you, as always, to my lovely, lovely patrons who support me both financially and spiritually. And also just as much thanks to my viewers who are still interested miraculously in my stuff, even though I haven't posted in a year. It means so much. And I'm really going to try and post more often. Thank you.